AI um, has been around for, for quite some time. It's, it's not a new concept. Um, we see that you know, many of our clients uh, implement different capabilities like recommender systems, computer vision, you know, NLP, and so forth. Um, but that being said, um, it remains critical that clients stay current with some of the new techno technological advances within AI, for example, LLMs. And um, we do believe um, you know, those capabilities could add um, tremendous value um, if you know, applied responsibly and thoughtfully. I think the thought is very much the same. Um, the way I would say it is that there's a lot of excitement around LLMs currently because it unlocks a, a frontier that has previously been inaccessible. Like natural language is just hard. Um, and so it gives you the opportunity to process these inputs that were previously unavailable. We see often overhyped, you know, enthusiasm with certain new technologies. Um, and uh, it's usually, you know, related to people not necessarily understanding these technologies. Um, but that being said, we've, uh, I think a lot of time have now passed uh, since LLMs have been introduced. Uh, and I think a lot of organizations are starting to understand how these uh, capabilities could be applied. But um, there remains, you know, certain challenges around getting these technologies out of a sort of R&D um, initiative into actual productionization, right? So um, I don't know if you guys want to, you know, maybe touch on some of that and your thoughts on it. Yeah, so my thoughts is that it's, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say it's a silver bullet, uh, but again, it's a new technology that can unlock new opportunities and new efficiencies. Um, but it is, like I think any new exciting technology it does go through a bit of a hype cycle uh, where there's a big peak, you know, people get very excited about it uh, without understanding it. Uh, there's a lot of investment into that, uh, and often that can lead to, you know, a big drop off in that hype. Uh, get people get disappointed in terms of what it is actually capable of. And I think where we are now is we've been through a big hype cycle. Uh, you know, I get the feeling that people are starting to understand what it's not capable of doing uh, and realizing that. Uh, and they're also starting to understand some of the other sort of challenges around that. Um, it's not just about the AI or the LLM or the, the new tech. It's also about integrating that, you know, that new technology into your business and into your processes, uh, which is also a, a challenge that people are facing. So I think there are a couple of thoughts here. Um, whenever you're dealing with a new technology, um, cautiously optimistic is normally a good mindset. Like you need to be aware of what's coming, what opportunity it provides you, but the expression of it's too good to be true also applies. And so have context, but then it's also really important to understand what you're dealing with. And so all deep learning is function approximation. Uh, and the key word is approximation. Um, and mathematically it was demonstrated a while back that you can approximate an infinitely complex function and we're starting to see that happen where you can approximate this really complex function of language um, but remember it's an ap approximation it's not definitive and so whenever you're approaching any machine learning problem I think there's three rules that you need to keep in mind is that you have access to good clean data uh, you have a problem that is too complicated to model empirically um, and then you don't need a perfect answer because you're never going to get one. You're always going to get an approximate answer. If you can meet those three criteria, go for it. Unlock the value in your business. If you can't meet all three of those objectives, then don't go down the rabbit hole because you're going to disappoint yourself. The other thought is that any optimization, not at the constraint, is an illusion. And so it's really easy to see exciting tech come down the line and want to play with it and you're going to get people like me that go please please can i play um, and it's important to make that distinction between letting someone play and actually building a production system um, you need to have played in order to understand what it, you can do and then once you've understood you need to step away from that look at your actual business look at your actual needs look for actual problems that you want to solve and solve real value in your business. Otherwise, it's massive investment and very little return and value. 
couldn't agree more. I think uh, just to add on to that, and that's very critical um, point, is that, and I want to emphasize on, on finding the right problem to solve. And we have seen this time and again over the last couple of months in terms of you know some of these new capabilities that clients don't necessarily go and identify exactly what it is they want to apply this to. Um, it's an exciting new toy, a shiny new object and that we run after, but um, we need to apply our minds to, to that problem. Um, and we are seeing that happening now, and I think people are starting to you know, slow down and, and actually apply their minds to, to sort of a fit-for-purpose implementation. Yeah, and just to add to that, like, and I think that's, that's very important to understand, is that there might be problems today that are better solved through existing technologies, you know, not new new technologies. So don't throw away the existing technologies that can solve your problem uh, if if that's more appropriate. Uh, and then look for the problems that, or you know, solve those problems that are more suited for this kind of technology. So again, we deal with customers uh, via communication, and so. Up until this point, language has been really difficult, and so communication has had to be very standardized, very formal. Um, that's why we've got web forms. That's why you get that annoying SMS that says, press 1 for, press 2 for, press 3 for. It's so that it's easily passable by a machine. Um, we've gotten to the point where we can pass language with a good degree of confidence, and that unlocks a whole bunch of potential. It allows you to engage in a more human way and understand people's intents as they engage with you. I think it's also really important to keep watching this space because we also know that human communication is more than just speech. You get a lot from visual cues. You get a lot from intonation. Um, and so as we get these multimodal models that can handle more and more input and create a collection and a representation from all of those communication paths, we'll be able to better understand and engage with customers quicker. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I think um, back to the previous point around sort of finding the right problem to solve, and as Rob has now outlined, that this is very much language focused and sort of um, it, uh, it would be naive not to apply these capabilities to sort of uh, client-centric channels and, and, and kind of augmenting existing client servicing capabilities. And there's undoubtedly value to be added, but there are always uh, massive risk involved um, with using sort of undeterministic uh, capabilities, or non-deterministic rather. Now, <coughs> what we are seeing um, is that you know, taking sort of an iterative approach, um, you know, moving out of R&D, then, you know, applying it and productionizing it, but perhaps, you know, focusing on more sort of an internal, you know, implementation um, and taking it through responsible iterations and then eventually getting to a point where you could expose it risk-free to customers or clients in a certain way. So... When we look at client servicing as, as an example, you know, uh, utilizing these capabilities to empower um, agents that serve these uh, sort of customer interactions um, would be a really good place to apply this. And I, I think that goes without saying, but it is important to understand that there are challenges with actually achieving that implementation. And then we could maybe touch on that, you know, a bit later in terms of integration and, and bringing these capabilities into an existing ecosystem. Yeah, so I think just on the ground, like that's what we're seeing. We're seeing two m major opportunities. The first opportunity is to uh, build these these uh, systems that help all these assistants uh, that help the agents, you know, have access to to more personalized information, more uh, a bigger uh, cohort of information that they can use to to interact with clients in a much more personalized way. Uh, that is one very good use case. Uh, and then building up to a point where you can expose them safely, as Shrike mentioned, to the, your clients uh, in a safe way, but then also use that as an opportunity to, to almost um, uh, free up the, the agents from sort of the, the easier tasks and the easier interactions and having them focus on harder problems and harder challenges uh, in terms of their actual interactions with the client. We're talking about LLMs because it's an exciting space. But if you don't have a language-heavy business process, then 
don't feel like you're missing out. There's these talk technologies available to various spaces. Like if you're in man manufacturing, there's immense value in computer vision. And again, it's a well-studied field and it's looking at that, how do I go from the study to my business process? How do I marry these things together? And that's where the value is. I don't think, and we haven't said it explicitly, but for most people, the value is not going to be in building the next model. The value is going to be in leveraging what these really capable, intelligent people have put many, many man hours and billions of dollars into. Absolutely. And, and maybe <laughs> that's a, while we're on that, maybe segueing into some of that conversation is that to that point, it would be absurd to go and try and build your own model. People have solved this problem already. Don't reinvent the wheel. And, and perhaps now is the right time to discuss that we, we actually see people understanding some of these capabilities and standing up their own models internally, um, but they're struggling to understand how to apply it within the existing ecosystem. So um, if you look at what we do as a bespoke software development company, we, we have been focusing for many years on, on solving sort of, you know, um, integration patterns and orchestration of, of different sources of information through the organization in a meaningful manner, you know, to ultimately go and solve core operational problems. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've definitely seen those challenges and we most definitely helping some of our clients to, to achieve that and, and solve that critical problem. And people see these capabilities as an answer to the entire problem. If I have to go and quantify from a percentage perspective based on some of our experience and what we've seen now in the industry, is that it really forms part of 20% of optimization. It depends, and I need to be careful what I'm saying, you know, and that's just a rough estimation, is that 80% of the actual issue is the implementation around the capability, the complexities in the workflows and the processes that need to be executed in terms of um, sort of uh, exposing the capability into the ecosystem. Uh, massive amounts of effort are going into software development and custom implementations to solve the auxiliary capabilities or the capabilities around these technologies. Um, so yeah, that's something to be cognizant of. Yeah, and I think I think these things are only going to get better, better, right, as we go. So I think they're they're at a point now where uh, they are really good, uh, and especially if you use them in the right way. Uh, but there are limitations uh, that uh, a lot of these sort of integrating systems need to consider and need to build for uh, to to sort of cross that divide between what they can currently do uh, and how they are actually useful. Um, we haven't even touched on the whole data architecture that goes behind the model, you know, getting that data, prepping it, uh, that's a whole massive um, uh, undertaking by itself, yeah. So, so that's, and that's where a lot of the effort goes, is just getting the data right, getting all that data, your enterprise or organization's data, into a structure or into um, a, da a data structure that is useful and can be you know, leveraged by the models to, to answer questions without you know, giving the wrong answers. Um, and there's the risk, right? The risk is that these things are really good, but they're not perfect yet. Uh, so how do you guard against that? And they're only going to get better to a point where you know, a lot of those problems will probably going to go away over time uh, as they evolve. But right now, you have to sort of guard against that kind of stuff uh, by building things around it uh, and integrating it carefully and thoughtfully. Uh, so that you don't introduce risk to yourself as an organization and reputationally to your clients as well, obviously. 